Imagine going to the bank to borrow thousands of shillings to invest in a business that promises mouth-watering financial returns only to return later to realize that the promise was only meant to lure you into investing. Conned by Peter Wangai's famous Greenscape Greenhouses Limited. Too much ambition breaks a man, but too little takes him nowhere. That is a famous quote by John Luganda in his play, The Burdens. This is the dilemma that the main character in this episode finds himself in. Does he relax and let fate dictate his life? Or does he take matters into his own hands? Is it a case of too much ambition or was it a premeditated financial scam? This is the story of John Moradi Wangai, a man whose enterprise went down with billions of investors' money. It is also the story of a boy who traces his route back to Nyandaro. If you have ever woken up in Nyandaro, then you have a different definition of cold. Every morning, the humid air from the mountainous ranges hangs low its dense cold reaching a single digit in temperature, 2 degrees. A thin layer of ice clings to the plants instead of dew. It is common to find the natties with thick jackets on their backs, gum boots on their feet, and woolen hats over their heads. It is not until late afternoon that the foggy air will clear and allow visibility of the mountainous outline. It appears like a seal holt of the stretched hide of a deer, the Kikuyus, who often slaughtered animals for feasts and ceremonies, referred to animal skin as roa, and the process of stretching it to dry as nyanda. So the range was known as nyanda roa. Nyanda roa is one of the food baskets of Kenya, a production powerhouse in potatoes, cabbage, carrots, peas, milk, and other vegetables. However, due to its poor state of infrastructure, especially the roads, 46% of its residents live below the poverty line. This was the situation that Peter Moraid Wangai would find himself in while growing up. As a little boy, he would spend a lot of time in his parents' farm. There was a bumper harvest after a bumper harvest of potatoes and cabbage every season. Peter observed how poorly his father would be paid for a sack of potatoes that was often overstocked. The problem, he heard his father say, was brokers. He observed how the cabbages would rot in the shamba during the rainy season, which was almost every day throughout the year, as the roads would be impossible by the buyers. But with all the hardships that village life brought, Peter managed to pursue an education, hoping to make a better life from agriculture, for him and for those around him. He attended La Sogwa Primary School in Yahururu area. His family was poor, so he was sponsored by wealthy wishes. He then studied tours and travel at college. In early 2000s, Peter decided to move to the nearest town from his village, Yahururu. He had no problem adjusting, as Nehururu was so cold, as cold as both Lujin, where sailors say even fire freezes. Employment was hard to come by. Life was as hard as nails, but Peter couldn't fathom returning home, back to the waterlogged plateau beyond the Abadeas. He was willing to take anything that came by. He was god fearing. His mother had raised him as a staunch Christian, but here in town, he had learned to lie without feeling guilty. He had to survive. For the next two years, 2004 through 2006, he set up a tree hawking business on the roadside, in the outskirts of Nyohororo town. He pounded soil mixed with cow dung remains into the back of a black polyden pouch, planted tree and flower seedlings into them watered them daily and fended off wandering stray cows and sheep. He'd eventually sell a piece or two in a day, 
getting enough money for a meal. But he was tired from living for the Tommy only. He dreamt of owning things, cars, houses, land, etc. Between 2006 and 2010, Peter would try expanding his tree seedling business, hopping from one idea to the other, each failing more spectacularly than the last. But his fortunes would change when a friend introduced him to the concept of brokering and selling land and, and, and architectural landscaping. Just get me a buy, the friend had said. Whatever he pays beyond the asking price will be yours to keep. At around the same time, he also discovered that one could advertise his business on Facebook. And so he embarked on a journey of self-improvement, learning how to use Facebook, creating pages and groups, paying for adverts and responding to inquiries. Peter had also started improving his English, thinking fast in his mother tongue and quickly translating it into English, speaking slowly so that he can hear his thoughts and consciously carried his tongue around R's and L's for fear of the Kikui accent weighing his tongue down. But he's still trying. Meanwhile, across the country, men and women soiled their garments in toil. Some in blue, others in white collar jobs. But to all, it was the brown paper that mattered. In 2013, Shabab Nakuru, Jen, not her real name, was preparing to start a new job as an admin officer in a small manufacturing company. She was optimistic of the future, especially now that she had moved away from her toxic husband to start life with her 8-year-old son, Dan. Jane was not earning much, but it was enough for her rent, her son's school fees, and her household's maintenance. Every month, she sacrificed a lot of her vices and pleasures in order to save towards her son's high school fees. She saved in a fixed deposit account with the local bank. 2014, in Retadia Dika, George and his friends had just finished registering the Sylvia group as commonly referred to Chama. He is a master in carpentry and joinery, but a struggling fundi. So together with his friends, they decided to take the economic matters into their own hands. The plan was to pull funds together, buy workshop equipment and machinery and open the biggest wood workshop in Dika town. George and his friends started with a simple saving plan, a hundred shillings every day, and they would meet every Sunday to reconcile their accounts. In 2015, in Tulele, Narok, Jacob, or less than two, a seasoned wheat farmer, was getting ready for another long day on the farm. He owned an expansive 64-acre farm that he had inherited and some that he had leased. He was known around the village as he was the he was also a dairy farmer. His Hilux pickup truck was a common sight at all community functions, weddings, fundraisers, funerals, and all. Jacob was man of the people, a rock in the community. He made a lot of money farming. I mean, over time, not all seasons were the same. Sometimes the harvest was bumper, but the market prices were low. Sometimes the rain came late. Sometimes wilt would affect the whole crop. But he persisted and eventually had enough saved to absorb shocks in case of bad seasons. By 2015, Peter Moredi Mungai had managed to sell some land and had gotten a good commission. He had saved and was looking to embark on agriculture. He went back to his rural home. He poured almost all of his savings on potatoes and cabbages for a season. And just like his father before him, he did not make as much money as he had expected. Why is it? Peter decided to change the way he farmed. He wanted a way that he could control the outcome, despite the weather. He wanted maximum output on crops. He was hungry to succeed. That is when the idea of greenhouses hit him. Low on funds, he approached the friend who had introduced him to the business of selling land from commission. He had an elaborate plan, 
I'm here to source the greenhouses. How to manage the crop and cut costs associated with too much cold or drought. He needed a capital injection of 200,000 shillings with which to build a greenhouse, pipe the waterways, buy the seeds and necessary inputs to sustain a tomato crop. He would provide the labor. In his estimation, he would make 250,000 shillings in six months. After deducting the operating expenses, the venture would not make a profit. He would therefore need to reinvest and hope to break even after one year. Then he would start paying back the capital plus interest at 15% interest rate. He hoped his friend would buy his plan as it was realistic. No, you will just be tying up my capital. His friend had dismissed him. No one will let you stay with his money that long. He approached his local bank, but he did not have enough collateral to qualify for the loan. It was George Clason who said in his book, The Richest Man in Babylon. If a man has within him the soul of a free man, will he not become respected and honored in his city in spite of his misfortune? And it was that fire within Peter that propelled him to overlook his current obstacle. He knew he'd get a breakthrough, but he wanted it now. He approached a local businessman, one that was a risk taker and that was expecting high returns. It was here that he changed his presentation. He now sought 500,000 shillings with a promise to pay 20,000 shillings every month for three years. He had just promised a 44% return on investment to a businessman. Peter did not see the risk in it at all. He knew he could make the greenhouse project work and make money while at it. So he secured his first ever backing and off he went to work. He did not even have a registered business name, so the money was deposited in his personal bank account. He then started coming up with the concepts of a business name. After reading countless of motivational books and Bible verses, he had always felt the urge to identify himself with God. He felt that he was the golden age dreamer, and all his concepts had to be bathed under this banner. From tree nurseries to selling land, landscaping, and now greenhouses, he felt that the best name to identify his premise would be Golden Skip. In no time, the first greenhouse was up and running, the crop was doing well, the market was ready, and the money was assured. Every month, he used part of the initial capital he had in not invested to pay off the loan. He was happy, and the investor was happy. I have a friend who wants you to invest his money. Are you able to do the same? That text message from the first investor changed the course of Goldenscape for the next five years. It was to be the boom of greenhouses. In 2016, Jenny Shabab was doing well with his son, Dan. Dan was now in class 5 and already showing signs of being a great mathematician. In 2016, George and his friends in Waitedi had already saved over 200,000 shillings and were in the process of acquiring new machinery. In fact, they had increased their daily contributions to 300 shillings as business was doing well. In 2016, Jacob had acquired another tractor and leased an extra 20 acres. He wanted to diversify his farming by introducing maize and other legumes. And unbeknown to them, their paths were now realigning and leading towards meeting Peter Moridi Mungai. Now, counting or bookkeeping is one skill that most people who hustle tend to undermine. They say, as long as I can count money, I don't need any classes. That is the kind of knowledge that the Bible talks about in Proverbs 24, 3 and verse 4. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. It is the lack of such knowledge that, according to statistics, causes 80% of all startups to fail. The basic business model dictates that capital is used to acquire income-generating assets, which in return generate income. 
The generated income covers first the production cost, also known as the cost of sales, the stocks, the inputs, the raw materials, etc. The second thing covered is all operational costs such as salaries and wages, fuel, repairs, maintenance, marketing, etc. What is left is then subjected to corporate taxes. Then from the remaining income, an amount is set aside for investment, also known as retained earnings. It is only then that the providers of capital can be repaid. This amount to investors is known as return on capital or as is common in corporate dividends. This ensures the continuity of the business and guards against unrealistic expectations by the providers of capital, that is investors. This is the required and expected accounting practice and any auditors who satisfies anything that does not follow the international accounting standards is not worth his name. Peter ignored the above laid concept, but none of his initial investors could tell either. Unfortunately, I was not able to ascertain whether there were financial statements at the end of every financial period, and if so, if they were audited. He operated with 100% backing by investors, with a promise of 72% annual return. In comparison, if you were to invest in Safaricom, you would buy a share for 29.8 shillings. The share would earn 1.74 shillings, which is a 5.84 return on investment and you'd be paid a dividend of 1.39 shillings which translates to 4.6 percent of your investment if you invested 320,000 shillings in safaricom you would earn 18,700 shillings every year but at greenscape an investment of 320,000 for one of the greenhouses one one and 550,000 shillings paid in two installments at the end of six months, each of 275,000. This was the hooker and sinker that attracted hundreds of investors. I use the word investors here with a pinch of salt, I'll bet with some seasoning too, as it is a glorified way of referring to gamblers, unintentional gamblers. Facebook ads led many more inquiries, but referrals were their main source of business. Peter Moridi Wangai, through his Golden Skip company, was now receiving millions of shillings every month. There was a robust expansion plan of greenhouses in areas with cheap land rates, from Ruti and Laikipia. The once shy boy, with a acne face and short scruffy hair, had started to glow. Pricey dermatological ointment and hair oil had rejuvenated his youth. His once frail frame was now stout, and his refined English suited his now important role, or roles considering he referred to himself as the founding chairman, the CEO, and also the managing director. He sat in a big office, and although he was supposed to be a professional financial advisor, his Office portrayed his boyish wealth fantasy. It looked like a washroom with a dining room and a bedroom in it. Potted artificial plants dotted the corners. For an agri enthusiast, one would expect at least live exotic plants. The walls were bright gold and blue, with his huge portraits seemingly seeking attention. He had a TV stand in it too, and a cabinet perhaps for utensils. A large chandelier hung above his desk. Not that it was necessary, but he felt the need to show the opulence that comes with money. Girls were also starting to notice him, especially now that he owned a big car and a very fat bank account. What followed in the next two years, 2017 through 2018, was a remarkable expansion fueled by the strategic plan to embark on marketing through social media, TV and radio. Every six months, the investors received their returns. They would do so in a ceremony, a five-star street at an upmarket hotel in the full view of a paid media house for 7pm and 9pm business news segment. 
the investors were asked to bring their family and friends to be guests on these momentous occasions. The recipients were first given large dummy checks and asked to smile for the camera as the participants clapped in the background. The pictures were then splashed on social media pages with the caption, We pay no stories. More investors pledged their cash. Peter Moradi Wangai's bank accounts were now busting the seams. There was a Facebook page splashing the images, a YouTube channel with a hired TV presenter to push the agenda, and periodic media tours to validate the idea. There was no board to advise him, no watchdog to curtail his indulgences, and no regulator to protect the investors. He was blessed with a beautiful wife. Everyone knew her around the Sultan House offices. You could see the way men looked at her. The same look a man with girls looks at roast meat. You know, pleasure you can't have but poison you want to try. Brown, flawless skin with her eyelashes carved by a premium salonist. She had the blossoming feet for fertility goddess. Her hips protruded falls like Lebanon cedar and rested gleefully on her set of ebony feet that were ever in heels. Her extravagance was without consequence, and like a spoiled child, whatever business idea she had was implemented without any feasibility study or financial appraisal. They expanded their land selling business and started property development. One such project was Golden Triangle Homes to construct four and five bedroom mansion it's at approximately 100 million shillings. Golden Hills Estate, another 100 million shillings. Amal Heaven Homes, 100 million shillings. The other multi-million projects were Vadudra Groceries, an ambitious grocery supermarket for fresh farm supplies in upmarket areas of Gong and Hallingham. Then Orion Online Market, an ambitious plan to be the next Jumi in Kenya. Then a series of other businesses, Golden Scape Architects, Golden Scape Logistics, Tunda Farmstead, and like cattle being led in a slaughterhouse, the investors came in their droves. But why are people gullible of such get rich schemes? In the 2004 British TV show, Hustle, Mickey Stones leads a group of highly skilled professional fraudsters who pull off a series of scams, but in each and every successful scam, one thing is constant. They promise someone something big at the cost of almost nothing. The victim believes that he's the one benefiting. Then at the end, to the agony of the victim and to the whimsical confidence of the fraudsters, the victim loses something big and gets nothing in return. Through history and in all parts of the world, con artists have had field days targeting the ignorance of the masses. In 1920, Charles Ponzi started what is today referred to as Ponzi schemes, promising big returns but delivering nothing. Kenya has had its fair share of pyramid schemes. I am sure you know some or have been part of one. The promise of easy money is but a wolf's trap laid out for sheep seeking taller grass. In 2019, around December, a man known to Jane met her in Akuru town. Jane was now established in her workplace, making good money and giving her son a good life. She also had a good fund in her fifth deposit account. She was focused on making sure her son had a good education at a good school. The meeting with the man was not by chance. He was an old friend who dealt with second-hand cars. He had met Jane with the intention of selling her a car. But Jane said that she was not but Jane said that, that was not in her immediate plan. She was not looking to engage in something that she had not planned for. It's then, during that coffee meeting, that he mentioned Golden Scape to Jane. But Jane said she was not looking to engage in something that she had not planned for. 
who insisted, telling her that he had invested 320,000 shillings in June and that in December he was waiting to receive a check of 275,000 shillings which he would be earning for every six months. Are you sure? Jim asked. Yes, he replied. I will believe when I see it, she quipped and hurriedly left to pick her son from school. Then two days later, on a Thursday, Jim got a call from the same guy. He prevailed upon her to accompany him to Nairobi that coming Saturday. It was pity, she agreed, because she wanted to see, so as to believe. They got to the venue, a construction site of the ongoing Golden Triangle homes. Catering was outsourced, tea, coffee for the cold, fresh fruit beautifully cut and arranged on a plate at each table, string cheese sticks and humors on pita bread. Lunch was equally exorbitant. But it was the presentation that caught Jane's attention. The CEO struck MD struck chairman was well dressed, articulate and smooth. He talked of the emerging markets in Europe, the greenhouses they were constructing in Somalia, and the one billion fund financing he had secured in the UAE. TV cameras were rolling. There were other mobile cameramen walking around snapping up the eager orchests as the presentation went on, talked of the ongoing project, an exclusive living haven that will be available to platinum investors. Then, to crown the evening, he presented the dummy checks to the investors. Jen's friend was among those who get his return on investment of 275,000 shillings. He sprinted to the dars, got his check, smiled for the cameos, and went back to sit amid the applause of the mesmerized guests. Jane was more than impressed. She returned to Nakuru thinking of how lucky she was to have stumbled upon this opportunity. She watched the 7 pm news and saw the face of Peter Murray the guy, and he heard his smooth voice say, We pay, no stories. The following Monday, she called her bank concerning the fixed deposit account where she was saving for her son. She requested to withdraw the full amount, all 650,000 shillings. George and his carpenter friends from Witadi had also been convinced at the same meeting, all 10 of them. Since the business had grown to an imaginable height, they agreed to take a loan of 3.2 million shillings so that they could invest in 10 greenhouses, one for each member. Jacob from Narog was not to be left behind. He could easily raise money for three greenhouses. In his mind, he even contemplated venturing fully into greenhouse business since he would make more money from a greenhouse than from his eight acres of wheat in one year. They deposited the investment sum to Peter Moridi Wangai's Golden Skip account and traveled to the head office to sign the contract. On reading the contract, one was fast struck by the first line. I salute you in the name of our Lord, he who gives us the power to make wealth. It is good that Peter believed in God. But what followed was a story. In sharp contrast to the assertion that they pay without stories. We were not able to pay our investors on 7th December but we shall pay them in February. The story continued for another six pages until they arrived at the summary in page seven. The terms had changed, the profit margins had been stripped and the waiting period made longer. But the unsuspecting investors had already deposited their cash and had no option but to sign the contract. They signed, then hoped for the best. Unknown to them, the storm had already started beating the business model that was on a toothpick foundation. Then COVID hit in 2020. Investors were still waiting to be paid, but the company was not showing any signs. Instead, they started rolling out new products, seeking new investors and asking current investors to roll over what they were expecting to another high-yielding project, like the Tunda Store. Investors were even asked to join the Golden Skip Circle and start owning a greenhouse with only 10 million shillings. There were marketing offers where an investor could get a car 
for the house for the whole year of 2020. No one was paid a dime. The coffers were dry, and the word that Golden Scarp was not paying was starting to spread. It was just a matter of time before this was exposed as an elaborate Ponzi scheme. Its only hope of survival would have been if there was an infinite number of investors who would bring money so that the likes of Jane, Jacob and George from Vitalia could get their return on investments. With an estimated 3,000 investors, the figures are astronomical. If each investor was to get the minimum payment of 275000 every six months, it means that the firm has to have the annual earnings attributable to shareholders of 275000 two times per year times 3,000 investors, which equals to 1.65 billion shillings. If this represents 30%, then it means the total earnings would have to be 5.5 billion. If this was the case, Golden Skip would have been in the league of blue chip companies. It would have been more profitable than Kenya Airways, five times more profitable than Bambori Shemi, and playing in the same league as the National Bank. It was with this all that Jen waited and prayed that she would recover her money. The constant posts on Facebook that gave her hope were no more. The YouTube uploads were no more. The phone stopped going through. Golden Scape was no more. Jane had lost her 640000 and the future of her son's high school education. George and his charmer had lost $3.2 The dream of the biggest workshop in Thika. Jacob from Narok had lost 960000 shillings in his farm inputs for almost three seasons. Peter Wangai had duped Kenyans over 18 billion shillings and unquantifiable amount of dreams. Peter was arrested, taken to court, but released on bail. 